Tonight on CFDK TV News, the Grey Cup Festival recently made a stop in Terrace. A lot of fines have been handed to, out to illegal ride-hailing operators in Richmond, and a big Lululemon shoplifting ring has been busted. Northwest BC's only television news team. We are CFTK TV News. Good evening, I'm Cal Maslin, and here's what's making the news in the Northwest and beyond for today. Back on Thursday, August 8th, an internet outage occurred in the evening that affected a lot of people throughout the Northwest, covering Prince Rupert Kinnaman and Terrace. It turns out that the reason that the outage occurred is because a vandal went and stole part of a TELUS fiber optic cable that led to people not being able to use the internet in any way, shape, or form until repairs were finished at around 2 a.m. The New Heselton RCMP got a report that same evening about a man allegedly cutting a cable that was placed behind the 28 in a local nearby motel that is just off of Highway 16. Currently, the police have not found a suspect, and their investigation into this case is still active at this point. Yesterday, the Grey Cup Festival continued its journey in the northwest of BC and stopped in Terrace and Smithers after Prince Rupert on Tuesday. CFDK's Damien Smith had a chance to stop by and see it. The Grey Cup made a stop in Terrace today as it approaches the end of its 75-stop trek over the span of four months. And I got a chance to speak to Jelena Salcedo, the site supervisor of the tour, who has been on the road since the tour's start in mid-May. It's been amazing. We've been to almost 50 cities and towns in British Columbia and just getting the whole province involved. Um, it's the first time in a decade that we have the Grey Cup happening in Vancouver, which will be November 17th. So it's just been exciting visiting all the small towns to the big cities. Everything that um, we experience in the big city is also in the small towns as well too. So we're very excited to give exposure to them as well. With stops in Prince Rupert on Tuesday, the experience up here in the Northwest has been quite different compared to the Lower Mainland for Salcedo and her staff. Now, much of the tour is set out to promote the Grey Cup Final, which will be hosted in Vancouver this year on November 17th. But getting a full province tour tends to give you a greater understanding on what British Columbia is really like. I think exploring the indigenous lands and just getting to know all of the people and where we come from, I think that has been a very pleasant experience for me. It's my first time up north in BC, so it has just personally been a very eye-opening experience to me. I'm actually from the prairies, I'm from Alberta, so just being able to experience this. Seeing the islands, especially in um, BC, has just been amazing. I was actually emotional the other day because it, there's just so much to see. Our province is huge. And the tour still has a couple more weeks left with their last stop in Victoria before the week-long celebration gearing up for the Grey Cup final. So the Grey Cup Festival will be a week before the Grey Cup happens. So it'll be from November 10th to the 17th and then we have the Grey Cup happening um, that day as well too. Very last day. From Terrace, I'm Damien Smith. A new urgent and primary care center is set to open in Williams Lake next year. The clinic will be open seven days a week and Health Minister Adrian Dix says extended hours of operation will make it easier for residents to access care. A statement from the province says there will be 18 full-time equivalent positions at the center, including family doctors, nurses, social workers and physiotherapists. It says the Williams Lake Center opening early next year will be the 10th urgent and primary care center operating in the interior health region. Coming up next, the recovery after a fire not far from Kelowna is making progress, albeit slowly. Welcome back. It was about a year ago that a wildfire began burning north of West Kelowna. In the days that followed, it ballooned in size and nearly 200 homes were destroyed. The recovery is still ongoing, but progress is a tad bit slow. It's impossible to forget the ferocity of the McDougal Creek fire, which started burning August 15th of 2023. It would later jump Lake Okanagan and scour entire neighborhoods. It was like 100 years of firefighting all at once in one night. Leaving some 200 homes in the area little more than rubble. Today there are visible signs of recovery and restoration, but danger still remains. Within our road right there's a lot of trees that uh, have been damaged. 
We need help to, to have those uh, trees removed. It's, there's a lot of them and it's quite costly. As West Kelowna looks to the province for funding, rebuilding homes has been faster for some than others. Many are still wrestling with insurance companies as others compete for tradespeople. All of those items factor into the length of time it takes. The Lacey family has just finished demolition. Their home went up in flames shortly before they moved in last year after losing their first house to an electrical fire in 2019. It's looking like a long road ahead. Um, it's putting a lot of strain on my, my partner's relationship. My kids are in therapy to kind of get through, you know, two fires with the PTSD. The Traders Cove home was uninsured and Patrick's kids had to plead for him to leave as the flames approached. Dad, get out or you're not gonna. I didn't want to leave because I knew what we were looking at and uh, end of the day, total loss. The West Bank First Nation is facing a triple whammy. Not only were dozens left homeless, 8,000 hectares of their lands were torched, representing a lasting ecological and commercial impact. A lot of lost timber, many animals uh, are gone, vegetation, uh, plants, uh, medicines, uh, we've got erosion issues. Those are still very significant uh, matters that are still going to be with us for years to come. They're rebuilding but are now facing a new challenge. Minimum 30% loss of uh, business activity. People are uh, shying away from the Okanagan. That is a lasting impact. If there's fear that there's going to be fires and smoke, why would you want a holiday here at the Okanagan? Clear skies in our beautiful community, so every, you know, certainly visitors are welcome. Let's keep our fingers crossed that we uh, get through the next few weeks uh, safely. Fears are growing within the South Asian business community in Surrey after yet another extortion attempt. It's a major issue affecting business owners across the country, and while some jurisdictions have launched successful investigations in the Lower Mainland, charges have yet to be laid. CTV's Ben Nesbitt has the story. Mounties in Surrey believe these two people who were driving this stolen car were behind the gunshots fired and attempted arson at a Port Kells home over the weekend. The brazen act followed by a threatening phone call demanding money. Actions investigators say are consistent with suspected extortion attempts around the country. As long as they meet with success, they're going to continue doing what they're doing. Superintendent Adam McIntosh is leading the national team the RCMP formed earlier this year to assist local police in B.C., Alberta and Ontario with the suspected extortion attempts targeting South Asian business owners. We certainly understand that this is a difficult thing for individuals, for business owners and their families. Several arrests were made in Edmonton last month after a series of shootings and arson attempts. We asked McIntosh if there's potentially international ties to any of these extortions around the country. He said any suspected foreign interference is handled by the RCMP's national security program. The fundamental component is around organized crime. This is an opportunity for organized crime to make money through intimidation of people who have money. While charges are being laid elsewhere in Surrey, where police say they've received 19 extortion complaints since November, there's been none. The president of the city's Board of Trade says many South Asian business owners are growing more concerned and don't know how to handle this. They're in fear, and not only for themselves, but for their staff, uh, for their clients. And, uh, and for their families as well. McIntosh says it's key that victims don't hand over money. Fundamentally, if it's not being reported and people are paying, it's very difficult for us to support and help to deter these activities. Surrey RCMP are asking anyone who may have information about an extortion attempt to contact them. Ben Nesbitt, CTV News, Surrey. More than $66,000 worth of fines have been headed out to illegal ride-hailing operators in Richmond. It's part of a joint three-month operation with the RCMP and province to crack down on the unlicensed services. As CTV's Abigail Turner reports, some of the drivers even had criminal records. Ride-hailing apps like Uber and Lyft are common ways to get around here in Metro Vancouver, but there are similar apps that are considered illegal. Richmond RCMP have apprehended 29 drivers who were using unlicensed operators. 
According to police, the illegal apps bypass the required background checks and safety protocols that are mandated by the province, posing a significant risk to riders. Of the 29 drivers caught, one third of them were repeat offenders. Other users had poor driving records, convictions for impaired driving, and in one case, a driver was even a registered sex offender. You don't know who that person is, what their criminal record may be, what their driving history is, what type of driver's license they possess. So you are putting yourself at absolute risk by getting into the car with these illegal operators. $66,000 worth of fines were handed out over the three month operation, including operating a vehicle without a license and having the wrong class of driver's license. RCMP were asked if they'd also focus their efforts on targeting the apps as well. The department said their goal was to focus on road enforcement. Abigail Turner, CTV News, Richmond. Turning to tonight's weather, the North Coast should end up seeing a few clouds plus a low of 11 degrees. The Terrace Kinabet area will get a few clouds of their own, but a low of 12 degrees instead. And the Bulkley Valley and Lakes District is set to see partly cloudy conditions at a low at 6 degrees. On the North Coast, their next week or so will start off sunny before getting cloudy and rainy, and the high will shift from 21 to 17 degrees. In the Terrace Kinabet area, the week for them will also see sun to begin before having rain settle in, and the high will bounce between 28 and 19 degrees. And in the Bulkley Valley and Lakes District, the upcoming week for them will be similar to the others, but with a bit more of the sun and still a little clouds and rain at the end of the week, while the high moves from 28 to 19 degrees. Checking out the highways now, visit Drive BC for the latest and up-to-date conditions, and as always, drive safe out there. On Highway 16, there is a special travel advisory, utility work, construction work, crack ceiling, and the Usk Ferry is out of service due to the low river level. Highway 118 has some bridge construction, and Highway 37 just has some maintenance. And this is what the roads were looking like this afternoon around the region from the view of the province's highway cabs. Still to come, arrests have been made in connection with the death of actor Matthew Perry. Welcome back. Political leaders at the Victoria Fire Department are facing public backlash over a disciplinary action against a firefighter. Josh Montgomery wrote an open letter as both a father and first responder, voicing his concern with a homeless facility set to go up in his neighborhood. CTV's Yvonne Raymond has the story. Online and on the radio, public opinion has been swift, standing with a Victoria firefighter facing disciplinary action. He's being uh, punished. You know, what's that going to say to the next guy? Well, you know, he sees something wrong, he's not going to say anything because, uh, man, I'm, I might get disciplined here. I might, I might lose my pay, I might get fired and something might happen to me. The union president representing Victoria firefighters says... Local 730 can confirm that a member, Josh Montgomery, was disciplined for his opinions shared in a letter to Premier Eby. In it, Montgomery expresses opposition to a planned outreach centre for the unhoused community in North Park. He says the Dowler Place site, which includes harm reduction services for drug users, is 100 feet from where his kids play at their home. My suspicion is that the city probably takes position that uh, it, he was speaking for the city or he was speaking as a Victoria firefighter, which never happened. He always spoke as a resident of the North Park neighborhood and that he was a first responder. He never mentioned that he was an employee of the city of Victoria. Because it's a personnel matter, the city is refusing comment. He said mayor and council is not involved in the operation. That doesn't mean they weren't consulted or they weren't informed. 
A lawyer who's unaware of the details in Montgomery's employment contract says people need to be mindful of what they say. I tell all my clients and everyone I talk to, be careful with what you post online. You know, just, just use sound judgment. Uh, it is a high bar to lose your entitlement to severance if you're an individual employee for something you say online, but it's not impossible. Hundreds of people have weighed in to one of the posts on social media, with some indicating interest in a protest on Josh's behalf. The union says his day-long suspension will take place August 16th. Yvonne Raymond, CTV News, Victoria. Transit police have busted an organized shoplifting ring targeting Vancouver-based retailer Lululemon. They've seized tens of thousands of dollars worth of stolen merchandise that investigators say was destined to be sold on Facebook Marketplace. CTV Shannon Patterson has the details. This is what nearly $100,000 worth of stolen Lululemon merchandise looks like. In July, more than 800 items were seized at a Burnaby property by transit police investigating an organized shoplifting ring. The two men that were arrested in Burnaby who were the kingpins of the um, organization were arrested on charges of trafficking in property obtained by crime and possession of property obtained by crime over $5,000. Police allege those men were paying street-level shoplifters to steal certain items from Lululemon stores and would then turn around and sell the stolen goods on Facebook Marketplace. I think you got to be uh, aware that there are a lot of stolen goods on places like Marketplace, even Craigslist. It's where everyone goes. Facebook, they've got 2 billion people worldwide using their platform. So uh, you want to go to where you can sell things easily, and they've made it very easy to do so. There are countless postings for Lululemon products on Marketplace in Vancouver. Many advertise the items for sale as brand new. Buyers either don't know they're stolen or don't care. The reality is if there were not people willing to purchase these items uh, in whatever format, whatever venue, um, then the theft would not be happening. For the RCMP or any Metro Police to investigate all of this, they, they, they don't have the manpower. I think it really comes down to places like Facebook actually taking steps to I guess, safeguard their, their, uh, you know, their customers, their clients that are using the platform by verifying them if they're selling on Marketplace. The prolific shoplifter and the two alleged kingpins in the Lululemon stolen goods ring were all charged and promptly released. We make this huge package to the Crown Prosecution Services, and we hope that people um, are held accountable for their actions. It's exceptionally frustrating. For, for everybody involved, just because it is the same thing over and over and over again, and there appear to be so little consequences. The legal consequences for the accused in this case have yet to be determined, but their stolen goods operation has been shut down. All the merchandise returned to Lululemon. Shannon Patterson, CTV News, Vancouver. The Los Angeles police have made multiple arrests in the overdose death of Fred star Matthew Perry. The 54-year-old who grew up in Ottawa died last year after a long struggle with addiction. Here's NBC's Chloe Velas. Tonight, federal investigators revealing a web of people motivated by greed, including two doctors who they say took advantage of a vulnerable Matthew Perry, supplying him with lethal amounts of ketamine, a well-known party drug, but primarily a medication used for anesthesia, and in recent years prescribed as an alternate treatment for depression. Matthew Perry sought treatment for depression and anxiety and went to a local clinic where he became addicted to intravenous ketamine. When clinic doctors refused to increase his dosage, he turned to unscrupulous doctors who saw Perry as a way to make quick money. Among those charged, Perry's live-in personal assistant, who investigators say administered that final lethal dose that resulted in his death last October. Officials say the lead defendants are Dr. Salvador Placencia, known as Dr. P, and alleged drug dealer Jasmine Sangha, known as the ketamine queen of North Hollywood, according to the Department of Justice. Attorneys for both did not immediately respond for comment. In the fall of 2023, Mr. Perry fell back into addiction, and these defendants took advantage to profit from the 18-count indictment lays out how over the course of just one month in the fall of 2023, prosecutors say the ring of individuals supplied Perry with dozens of vials of liquid ketamine, charging the star upwards of $60,000. He wrote in a text message, quote, 
I wonder how much this moron will pay. Investigators say that these individuals knew Perry had struggled for years with addiction. They knew what they were doing was risking great danger to Mr. Perry, but they did it anyways. After Perry's death, the Los Angeles County Medical Examiner's Office revealed the level of ketamine in Perry's body were so high that they were equivalent to the amount used during general anesthesia during surgery. The arrests after Perry's death comes after high-profile celebrities like Michael Jackson and Prince overdosed and died after also being supplied drugs by medical doctors. Jackson's doctor, Conrad Murray, was convicted of involuntary manslaughter in 2011 for improperly administering propofol to the singer. If you are in the business of selling dangerous drugs, we will hold you accountable for the deaths that you cause. Chloe Malas, NBC News, Los Angeles. And now we turn our attention to the stock markets. The Canadian dollar is up five one hundredths of a cent. The price of gold is up forty-five dollars and forty cents. Oil is down one dollar and fifty-one cents. Natural gas is down seven cents. Aluminum is up twenty-eight dollars. In Toronto, the TSX is up 21.89 points. The Venture Index is up 8.09. In New York, the Dow Jones is up 96.70, and NASDAQ is up 37.22. Still ahead, Jeff Goldblum has some tips for those trying to impersonate him. Welcome back. Actor Jeff Goldblum took a playful shot at a CTV weather anchor as Mark Durischin did a brief impersonation of the Hollywood star on CTV Morning Live, and it turns out Goldblum thinks his act needs a little work. CTV say John Alexander has the details. Jeff Goldblum is awfully busy at the moment, filling in on the Jimmy Kimmel Show. This is my third night hosting. So we don't believe he himself actually caught our morning newscast. But someone from his team did. They featured a clip of me, believe it or not. We did. A clip of the star from the night before. I lived right there. Followed by a little CTV Morning Live chit-chat. And that's when our Mark Dreesen, well, went all in. That's where I used to live. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Good that, impression. That's that interesting. Yeah. Good impression. Oh yeah, that's a really great. good impression. Wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. You know, I've seen uh, many lackluster impressions of me, um, and that's one of them. That's one of them. That was a little... <laughs> yeah, I got burned. <laughs> wow, okay. Goldblum has an impressive award-winning career that spanned many decades. It's uh, Jeff Goldblum. And he's used to people trying to mimic his style. Here we go, Jeff Goldblum, guiding you, you creature, you goblin. Yeah, just, you know, uh, just a something. Just a student to me, a student to me. You're a great <laughs> impersonator. To be honest with you, when I did it yesterday, and as soon as it came out of my mouth, I thought, <laughs> oh, no, that's not very good. And of course, it would be the one that he'd happen to watch. Oh, yes. this yeah. is insane. <laughs> oh, what the yeah. heck are they doing watching our show and Eric, putting it on their show? I told you. Mark says, no hard feelings. He is still a huge fan. And Mr. Goldblum, if you come on our show, Mark promises to clean up his act. You can sit right here with us on the couch. We'll make yeah, room we'll for make you. Sinjin Alexander, CTV News, Vancouver. The Transportation Safety Board is issuing safety reminders after a fatal plane crash in southeastern BC from last year. A witness called 911 last November 24th after watching a Piper Cherokee nosedive to the ground near the community of Briscoe. The board says operators need to be reminded to comply with required maintenance, to have oxygen masks when operating above 10,000 feet, and to make sure emergency transmitters are operating. The board's report says no exact cause could be pinpointed for the crash that killed the pilot and only person on board. That's all of our news for now. From everyone at CFDK TV News, I'm Kel Maslin. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.